All right. Well, welcome to the Ford and Energy Forum. Uh, this is our first forum of the fall 2023 semester. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us uh, today. Um, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the Research and Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute uh, at UW-Madison. And if this is your first time joining us for one of these forums, uh, our mission at the Wisconsin Energy Institute is to provide leadership on campus for multidisciplinary research, education, and outreach. And those efforts are meant to accelerate the world's transition to clean energy systems and solutions. So the Ford and Energy Forum is a part of our efforts to cultivate public understanding of energy issues. And this is a monthly series that brings together experts both on campus and off campus with the goal of encouraging cross-disciplinary dialogue and uh, to explore the important technical, social, political, and economic dimensions of a wide variety of clean energy innovations and topics. So today's forum on energy startups and climate investment actually falls within two important celebrations. Uh, this week is National Clean Energy Week, which uh, Governor Evers recognized in a proclamation today. Um, it's also part of UW-Madison Innovate Week, which is coordinated by the UW Discovery to Product, or D2P, and the UW Innovate Network. Um, so you'll see events happening today through Friday. Um, there's a great lineup of talks, panels, webinars, um, and networking events for campus innovators. Um, with inspiring stories and practical tools for turning your idea into impact. So uh, please go and check out innovate.wist.edu uh, to find the full list of events uh, going on this week. And thanks, Mary, to uh, put, uh, putting the link directly in the chat. So I encourage you to check that out and see what else is going on. Uh, before we get into today's session, I do want a few more announcements. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that the land that the Wisconsin Energy Institute occupies, as well as all of UW-Madison, is the ancestral home of the ho people who have called this land a joke since time immemorial. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the ho and the other 11 Native nations within the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. And I encourage you all to learn more and support the efforts of tribal nations in Wisconsin and who are leading the transition toward clean and just energy systems. Next, I ask you to save the date for our next monthly Ford and Energy Forum on October 24th, where the topic will be Empowering Wisconsin, Exploring the Complexities of Community-Driven Energy Transitions. Uh, more details will be released on that event uh, in the very near future. So uh, check out energy.wist.edu uh, with our events uh, to look for that uh, in the very near future. Also want to highlight uh, a new podcast, uh, What's Up Wisconsin, which helps break down complex energy technologies and other topics to plain language and what they mean for Wisconsin. So you can find it at any of the major podcast services or go to our website uh, on wist.edu. Finally, a few logistical notes. Um, we'll have opening remarks from our panelists and along with some Q&A with our moderator before taking audience questions. Um, if you do have a question, please submit that in the Q&A box, and you're welcome to uh, introduce yourself in the chat as well. Um, finally, if you need live captioning, uh, you can toggle that feature using the show captions button in Zoom. Um, if you have any other technical technical concerns, please, just, please let us know in the chat. With that, I'm happy to introduce our moderator today and to help uh, set the stage for today's discussion, uh, Abram Becker, uh, who is the Interim Director of Discovery to Product, or D2P, at UW-Madison. So in that capacity of uh, interim director, he works with the D2P team and the campus community to set and implement strategic plans and programs that facilitate the commercialization of faculty, staff, and student innovation, while also supporting the regional startup ecosystem. Abram has worked at D2P since 2016 as a mentor in residence and innovation and commercialization specialist. And prior to that, has more than 20 years experience in a variety of roles working with startups, nonprofits, and multinational corporations such as Ipsos, UBS, and Bristol Myers Squibb. So we're pleased that this event is part of D2P's Innovate Week and welcome uh, Abram to lead our discussion. Thank you, Scott. Um, and thank you all the panelists and all of uh, the attendees uh, for joining us today. I'm really excited uh, that everyone's here. I'm excited to hear. Um, everything that our panelists are going to be sharing with us today, um, talking about um, sort of the uh, huge challenges facing us um, from um, climate change, but also uh, the opportunities that affords um, sort of all of uh, you and the inventors on this call um, and uh, talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available, both in terms of uh, funding um, uh, being sort of 
one of the big things we're going to talk about is where do you find that funding? Where, what are the different pluses and minuses of some of those kinds of things? Um, but then we're going to talk about more than just funding. We're going to talk about people. We're going to talk about location. We're going to talk about some of these things. We've got um, uh, hopefully uh, a lively discussion for you. Um, and as Scott said, um, each of the panelists are going to talk for five or seven minutes. Um, I'll do a brief introduction, but really going to um, ask each of the panelists to, to, to do their own introduction because they know best um, sort of uh, uh, how to position uh, their expertise uh, within the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and then I'll have a couple questions, um, but really I'm uh, excited about the questions that all of you uh, as attendees have today. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over and we're going to start uh, with Morgan, um, uh, who's an, Morgan Edwards, Assistant Professor of Public Affairs here, um, who's going to start us um, sort of with a broad level, uh, talk a little bit about what's, you know, what are the challenges facing us, as well as what does some of her research say about uh, some of the opportunities and, and things that, that we can be thinking about as a community. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Morgan. All right. Thank you so much, Abram. And Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here and be with this amazing group of panelists talking about this important topic. Um, I'm Morgan Edwards. I'm an assistant professor of climate policy here at the La Follette School of Public Affairs. And I'm also an affiliate of our energy analysis and policy program. Um, so here at UW-Madison, I lead the Climate Action Lab. And one of our big focuses in our research is designing new ways to model the role of energy innovation in addressing the threat from climate change. And one of the big tools that we use to do this um, is integrated assessment models. Uh, so these are large scale models that have representations of our energy system, of agriculture, of climate, of land use and water use. Um, and these are the kinds of models that we use in thinking about setting national and international climate policy goals. Um, and one of the big takeaways from these models, we've been running scenarios for decades, is that in order to meet our climate policy goals, so limit global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius at the end of the century. These are goals that have been set out in the Paris Agreement. We need to reach net zero carbon dioxide emission, emissions by around 2050. And so that's less than 30 years away. It's a massive transformation of our energy systems in electricity, in transportation, in buildings, and in industry. Um, and according to the International Energy Agency, around a third of those emissions reductions to reach that net zero goal um, come from technologies that are in the early stage pre-commercial uh, development today. And so that means that designing policies to support energy innovation will be absolutely critical to meeting these goals. Um, and we know that startups play a key role in that process. So they're nimble, they can quickly bring new technologies to market and they can create jobs and grow local industries. Um, but they also need support to go from research and development to wide scale adoption. Um, startups need to scale and we need public policies and private investment to make that happen. Um, and, so, and so to start out our conversation, I'm going to talk about three different takeaways from our research here at the Climate Action Lab um, about how we can support climate tech investment. And so the first big takeaway is that in the investment in the private sector is growing rapidly. So we know historically the private sector has underinvested in climate tech. We can talk about some of the reasons for this. You know, these are large capital intensive, hardware intensive types of startups. It's very different from the world of um, software. Uh, but we also see a lot of evidence that that's changing now. Um, we recently, in some of our research, analyzed a large data set of almost 7,000 climate tech startups um, and found that since the Paris Agreement entered into force in 2016, on average, around 17% of those startups received funding from public agencies, but 59% received investment from venture capital and 34% received investment um, from corporations. So that means the, car, the private sector is getting more and more involved, and they're more involved in the later stages um, as startups start to scale. And that means that the investments that they're making can be more likely to be bringing technologies that we need in, in, for innovation in this decade. Um, the second key takeaway is that we still need public policy to support climate tech. Um, policy is really important to fill investment gaps in areas that aren't as attractive uh, for private investment. These can often be technologies that are less modular and less individualized, but that we still need to have the large scale energy transitions um, to reduce emissions. Um, and public policy can also help incentivize real emissions reductions. So things like focusing on technologies with low life cycle em emissions um, or approaches like monitoring to make sure that technologies are really reducing emissions in the way, um, in the way that they're claimed. And maybe even later on, thinking about ways to credit investors for the innovation benefits that they bring to society. 
And then third and finally, closer collaboration between startups and investors and modelers like me can help fill really important information gaps. Um, so on the modeling side, these models that we typically use for planning our long-term climate scenarios, they can be really slow to incorporate new innovations. And that means we might be underestimating um, what we can actually do as a society to address the threat of climate change. So by collaborating more directly with startups and investors and understanding these trends, we can better represent these new technologies in modeling and in policy. Um, and on the investor side, I think these models can help develop more sophisticated estimates of the emissions reduction potential of new technologies. So we can help guide uh, our investment dollars in a way that best supports climate action. Um, and those feedbacks are why I'm particularly excited to be talking with this group today. And so for, with that, I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Excellent, thank you so much, Morgan. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Shashank, uh, who is uh, gonna give us a perspective uh, from an investor. So not a corporate investor, but a, a, a venture capitalist uh, investing in into climate tech. Um, so uh, very happy uh, to have you here and uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Abram. And uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, this webinar today. And I'm happy to kind of be a part of this discussion. Um, so my name is Shashank Chirakanti. I work as a venture associate at Evergreen Climate Innovations. We're a seed stage venture capital fund um, based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and, you know, as a seed stage venture capitalist, especially in the clean tech sector, there's a lot of challenges that we look at, a lot of different verticals um, and industries that are both kind of capital light, but also capital intensive as they, you know, race to kind of decarbonize a slew of different sectors and uh, activities in the current economy. Um, the firm has been around since 2014, and we right now, actually just this past week, at our 43rd portfolio company. Um, and so we basically are within the clean tech sector. We consider ourselves somewhat generalists. Um, there's not specific verticals within clean tech that we focus on. Um, we definitely kind of spread across the entire area. Um, one of our core tenets is that we do look to invest in an area that we call the greater Midwest, which is kind of loosely defined as Denver to Pittsburgh. Uh, and a reason for that is, you know, there's a lot of great universities, a lot of great national laboratories in that region that we feel like don't have um, the same kind of per capita venture capital dollars that exist on the coastal communities, such as obviously the Bay Area and Los Angeles and Boston. So we feel like there's the same type of, you know, intellectual horsepower that's in the center of the country. It's just more geographically dispersed across more states, more communities. Uh, so we really pride ourselves on finding those opportunities, connecting different stakeholders and companies and CEOs to really kind of work together to face the challenges that are not only applicable to the area in the greater Midwest, but also can be scaled uh, nationally and globally as some of our portfolio companies have. Um, when we kind of talk about the composition of our portfolio, uh, like I said, it's 43 companies. It's about 20% uh, invested in the uh, built environment, which is typically um, investments related to building materials, building efficiencies, basically trying to uh, reduce the carbon footprints and um, kind of embodied carbon emissions within buildings. Um, it's also about 20% food and agriculture. So that can uh, be in investments related to improvements in farming efficiency, um, you know, reducing agricultural use of water, uh, increasing general data intelligence for regenerative farming, things like that. Uh, we also have about 10 to 15 percent of our uh, investments in the transportation sector, a fair amount in advanced materials and industrial applications. Uh, and really, we pride ourselves on the fact that we feel like our portfolio really represents quite well, uh, you know, the greater Midwest area, kind of what's um, what's popular in this center of the country, what industries really thrive, what challenges we're great at, um, you know, succeeding at. Um, so we're re we really take pride in that. Um, I think when we look at our core competencies as an organization, um, we are unique in venture capital in that we're structured as a nonprofit. So about 50 or more than 50% of our dollars that we invest with are actually philanthropically donated. So when we look at typical venture capital funds, those are structured in a way that paybacks to investors need to occur in like a 10 to 12, maybe 15 year uh, time period. Whereas for us, given that it's philanthropic dollars, we have a bit more of a patient timeline that doesn't require that same level of uh, payback period to the investors. So when we feel, when we look at the um, innovations that we invest in in the clean tech sector, and no, we, de we definitely understand that a lot of it is hard tech, a lot of it takes product development cycles that are not short. Uh, we feel like the patient investing model 
that we have at Evergreen really lends itself well to those deep tech innovations that sometimes come out of you know, university labs. Um, it could be the uh, national laboratories such as Argonne uh, in Chicago land and uh, Oak Ridge down in Tennessee. Um, we feel like there's a good kind of uh, symbiotic relationship that we have with our investment style, our investment interests, and also the challenges that companies like that take on. So that's not to say that we exclusively invest in those areas, um, but we do kind of consider that to be a good part of the strike zone that kind of fits our model quite well. Uh, for me, myself, um, I've only been at the firm for a little over a year, so I can't take credit for a lot of the investments that we have done so far. Um, prior to coming to Evergreen, I spent 10 years at SpaceX working in the avionics sector or the avionics uh, engineering department. Um, and so that really um, came from my background of electrical engineering. I worked a lot on um, the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy avionics systems and architectures. And I spent the last three years there um, leading a team working on an inner satellite laser communication terminal. Um, so the background that I helped bring to Evergreen is kind of hardware development, kind of, uh, you know, working on quickening iteration cycles, um, really bring some of the knowledge of product development um, that I learned from SpaceX into the clean tech sector, where hopefully we can help shepherd some exciting innovations um, going from lab scale all the way to commercial scale. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, about it for me. Oh, you're muted, Abram. Excellent, thank you so so much, uh, Shashenka. Now we'll um, move next to Matt. Um, who is uh, CEO at C-Motive uh, Technologies, uh, a portfolio company of Evergreen. Um, so Matt. Yeah, uh, so thank you for having me. Um, I'll start off with just a quick background about myself and then transition into what brought me to Madison um, to begin with. So my background, I have a uh, degree in, in mechanical engineering. Uh, turns out I'm not a very good engineer, which is why I do what I do right now. Um, but that degree got me into uh, my first startup company just a few years out of school. So in fact, C-Motive is my seventh startup. I've been in um, part of startups that are both venture backed as well as blue chip company backed, um, starting my career in Peoria, Illinois, going out to Seattle, Washington, then to New York. And then before coming here to Madison, I spent six years in Pittsburgh as part of a startup that was a spin out of Carnegie Mellon University. Um, across all of those startup companies, I wish I could say that they were all successful, but honestly, if they were, then I wouldn't be spending my time talking about this. I'd be golfing or doing something in a much warmer climate. Um, but the fact is that that's typical, right? So of my startup companies, uh, I was around for when Cleantech 1.0 busted in 2009, my, my startup, my baby at the time. Uh, we went through a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, I then, you know, went on to a couple others. My company in Pittsburgh, uh, Aquion Energy, we were spin out of Carnegie Mellon. We had raised over $190 million of venture capital money. We were on track for $25 million worth of revenue. We were literally bringing energy storage into people's houses, and we ended up in Chapter 11 bankruptcy because, as it turned out, we simply couldn't match the prices of what lithium ion batteries being sourced out of uh, out of Asia were able to do. So um, so that's my sob story is like a lot, a lot of experience, a lot of really cool stuff, but unfortunately not, you know, a ton of success in the clean tech space. Um, what brought me to see motive? I had never thought about motors as I assume no one on this phone or on this Zoom call ever really truly thinks about electric motors until I got a phone call from a recruiter that I had known saying that there was this awesome company spun out of Carnegie, or excuse me, spun out of UW Madison and looking to make that transition from a couple guys in a garage out by the airport to real company trying to get product out in the hands of people. And so that's where we're at right now. So C Motive is a venture backed hardware startup. We're based in Middleton. Um, we're a uh, series pre-A stage to give you a sense of where we're at, a team size of 18. And we're in that kind of weird, uncomfortable adolescent stage that every hardware startup goes through where we've got technology works on our lab bench, and now we have to give it to people in the outside world. We have to demonstrate to the investment community that, you know, don't just take my word for it. Don't just look at my pretty PowerPoint slides. People want what we have, and people want what we have for a variety of reasons. Um, couple facts about motors, you know, 95% of the world's electricity comes out of a rotating electric generator. Over 50% of the world's electricity gets consumed by electric motors. And they are a technology that no one ever thinks about because they sit 
in the background, silently spinning for years and years and years. And for far too long, these traditional motors are delivering 60, 65% net efficiency in their application. They're comprised heavily of uh, copper, rare earth, permanent magnets, neither of which are sourced out of this country. And like so many other technologies, we've just grown to take them for granted. So what we are working on C-Motive um, gets rid of the rare earth permanent magnets. We eliminate 90% of the copper. Instead of using magnet magnetism to do the energy conversion from electricity to mechanical power, uh, we use electric fields or electrostatic forces or the exact same force that everyone experiences when you pull clothes out of the dryer and you get a pair of socks that stick together. So fundamentally different physics. Um, and just to reflect on some of the comments already, right? It, it takes time. Technical development is not linear. Um, you never know when we're going to go through fits and starts of we make huge amount of progress and then we sit on this plateau for a couple months and then we take the next step up. The hardest thing that we have is, um, you know, getting investors to realize that even non-sexy applications and products like motors are vitally important if we are ever going to hit our climate objectives. Um, it is difficult to get investors to pay attention to companies that are in Madison because I don't know when the last time people flew in and out of Madison, but it is not the easiest place in the country to get to. I can't just get someone to show up to look and see what we're doing. So um, happy to you know dig into any of those sorts of challenges that we go through, but you know that's uh, that's a bit of background on us. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have uh, Jeffrey. Um, uh, joining us to talk to us about uh, Activate uh, Fellows, and um, uh, excited uh, to, to hear about this. And we've got a, a couple of uh, UW Madison grads uh, that are uh, participating. Uh, yes, uh, thanks everyone. Very, very challenging to follow this great group of panelists. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeffrey. I work at Activate as the fellowship manager for our Anywhere community. Um, a little bit about me, I'm I'm an engineer and policy researcher by training. I uh, did my PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon. And then I moved to Sacramento, California, which is where I currently am to do the CCST Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, working in the state legislature on um, electric vehicle policy. Uh, briefly did a postdoc at Davis before uh, being recruited to come back and run the policy fellowship program at CCST and kind of started this career trajectory where I am in um, working on um, working in various nonprofits, supporting, basically my passion is around helping scientists have bigger impact uh, with their work and their lives. Um, so I joined Activate about two years ago to help build and scale um, this Anywhere community. Um, so a little bit about Activate, uh, we run, our organization runs a two year science entrepreneurial fellowship program. Uh, we're currently supporting about 60 plus companies across our four communities. We have three residential communities, one in Berkeley, Boston, New York. Uh, and then our fourth one is what we call our Anywork community, uh, which is a distri distributed virtual uh, network of founders all across the country. Um, Activate's role um, in this ecosystem is um, we're here to help train uh, primarily technical founders who want to commercialize kind of some some hardware based science or technology out of the lab. Um, I think as we've been hearing here, there's a huge, huge gap between kind of the lab to market, especially in hard tech and then more specifically in clean tech. And so we want to be uh, providing um, scientists and founders with the time, the funding, um, the business education and kind of the community of other like minded um, hard tech founders, clean tech founders to um, kind of work together um, de -risk and really de-risk that technology during the two years of the fellowship to hopefully be set up for financing um, at the end of their fellowship. Um, and, but we're also an educational nonprofit at our core uh, and fellows first. And so we're not taking equity in these companies and our companies, we're really just focused on training the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, I think recognizing that in this space, like that the, the first company and these this first idea might not necessarily make it, but I think ultimately we need as many shots on goals um, as possible. And, and ultimately it's a win for the ecosystem if we do help prove that a technology idea or concept isn't commercializable or scalable yet. And we've tried this method and uh, just to let the ecosystem know that. Um, and then ultimately we've also trained a person uh, to, to have taken the entrepreneurial leap and made do so again in the future. And so we have lots of stories of fellows and companies in our portfolio. And we celebrate 
just as much as we celebrate our companies that are now moving on to you know series a series b rounds um, we celebrate those who've decided to close your company and are pivoting to other things but still contributing uh, into uh, this ecosystem um i think i'll just close so i specifically work on our anywhere community um and like i said um it's been a bit of an experiment for activate um, to take what was developed initially as a residential kind of community of founders and to do this virtually uh, we learned this because i think during the um kind of during the during because of the pandemic and remote work life that cr was created activate kind of learned that we could support our fellows virtually that our programming and our education could be delivered in that way um and then in that by creating a virtual community this is gonna this would be a way for us to respond to the huge demand for the, the support and the huge demand that's coming out of all of the entrepreneurial talent that's coming out of not our normal hubs like in Boston, out of MIT and especially on the West Coast of Silicon Valley and Berkeley and Stanford, uh, but across the country. And, uh, and then we found a government partner, uh, the National Science Foundation, who also has a similar vision for wanting to encourage science innovation across all 50 states. Um, and so they've been supporting Activate in this initiative. And so now we're at full capacity. We have two cohorts going, a total of about 18 companies that I'm managing uh, in our portfolio. Um, and as Abraham alludes to, um, three of our 18 companies are spin outs of UW Madison. So kind of why I'm personally really excited to be here, um, specifically talking with this audience about what we do at Activate, what we've learned, um, and then just a small plug that applications for our next cohort um, and our upcoming cycle is out. And so I really look forward to supporting more talent coming out of this area. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Jeffrey and everyone. Um, and lots of things to, to dig into based on your comments. So um, comments about location, comments about technology, comments about people, talent, um, et cetera. Um, but I guess I'll back up first and going back to some of the comments, um, Morgan, that you made about opportunities for closer collaborations um, between researchers as well as startups, researchers and funders. Um, you know, I, I guess um, my question is, you know, what does that really look like? Where are the near term um, opportunities that you think, you know, and is that, you know, you've got a startup and, a, and an investor here, right? I, and I would like to, you know, maybe just sort of the three of you for a second, what what does that really look like, you know? And are there real near-term opportunities to to impact the policy dialogue? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, researchers can mean lots of different things. So here, when I'm thinking about public policy researchers and modelers, we're really interested in kind of assessing the effects of policies and trying to design better policies. Um, so I think one area for that can be really helpful for collaboration, but also really tricky is thinking about appropriate kinds of data sharing. So there's lots of reasons why companies maybe don't want to share data. There's um, you know, concerns about proprietary data, but it can also be a real opportunity. So a lot of the information just about on a large scale, like what kinds of technologies are, are getting investment, what are the outcomes um, for those different startups? that data can be behind paywalls. So it's collected by third party organizations and it can be expensive. So I think just really having an open resource where we're documenting what's happening and we can start to try to understand, you know, tease out causal patterns, understand what the effects of different kinds of funding are, um, would be a really, from a researcher side, a really beneficial way forward. Um, but to ask for that kind of information, you have to provide, provide something useful in return. And so one thing that we've been thinking a lot about is the kinds of models that we use. They were originally designed for a kind of national and international policymaking context. They're not really naturally fitting with the kinds of questions that um, investors and startups might have. And so one thing that we're trying to do in our research group is to try to break down those barriers um, and, and better design the models to ask the kinds of questions that uh, those groups might find interesting. And so one type of question in particular is you're trying to understand the marginal effects of one particular kind of technology innovation. Um, this can be particularly important when you're thinking about a technology that maybe uh, provides some kind of service that is coupled with another technology. So storage becomes more beneficial as we have you know, expanded use of renewable energy and trying to tease out those different effects so that we can attribute emissions reductions to the new storage technology, I think can be really helpful when thinking about the benefits of different kinds of investments. Um, and then, um, 
Morgan, you alluded to, or you mentioned that that you've um, noticed a rise in corporate uh, venture capital um, into this space. Um, and I know, um, so Matt, I think in your recent round, you had a corporate investor. I don't know if it was a corporate VC or just rate them. I don't know what structure they had, um, but I'm curious, uh, you know, what, if any, um, benefits have you seen from having them come in to this round? Was that purposeful, you know, sort of in your previous um, companies, had you sought and uh, received any investment from corporate or corporate VCs, you know, and, um, you know, can you just expound a little bit on where you're at now and how's that compared to your past? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I've realized, my only job, my purpose in life is to make sure the C-Motive never runs out of money. Like above all else, my only job is to make sure we've got enough money to give the team adequate time, resources to take, right? What could be absolutely transformative technology and make sure we can get it to the market. Um, so with that as the background, man, I am open to anybody that wants to invest in this company and this technology on a personal CEO level. Right now, as, as a member of the board of directors with a fiduciary responsibility to all my shareholders, we obviously have to balance that out versus what each of the strategics would like to see in terms of their investment. And so taking strategic money is a good idea, pending what strings are attached, right? It would be not in, I would not be doing my job to my shareholders, including Shashank, if, we were to give up exclusivity, or if we were to box ourselves in with a certain technology with someone else, or we partnered up with somebody who, you know, maybe was less reputable in terms of how they treat intellectual property. So there is always a push and pull. Venture, uh, my experience shows that VCs don't always like strategic money. So looking at board dynamics and everything else, um, but it is a core part of our strategy right now. We as C-Motive do not want to be the ultimate manufacturers of this technology. We're looking to license the intellectual property, license the designs out to others who can proliferate it out, not just in the US, but in Europe and other places around the world. So we are not just open, but, but actively looking for partnerships on, at the strategic level who can provide money, but also channels into the market as well as technology advancements. Yeah, I think if I can add on to that, kind of being on the other side of the table, um, I mean, what, a lot of what Matt said is absolutely right. Like a strategic investor has a lot to add, particularly in the line of business that Matt is in, is, is in um, because it, it's very difficult. You know, there's not a whole lot of entities in the world that have stood up production lines for complex assemblies and been able to run them reliably and economically and survive. Um, the examples uh, is a lot longer for companies that try to do that and failed than succeeded. So there's a huge amount of learning that having a strategic on your side can can help you with, um, whether it's from things like supply chain and understanding the risks for your supply chain there, which you know is hard for a startup, particularly at C motive stage, to really kind of see that far and understand you know what has failed for others. Um, all the way through to you know quality assurance and all the kind of in betweens. It's it's always like easy to kind of think of the big things, but it really is the you know the devil's always going to be in the details. And so having a partner like that on board is is hugely uh, beneficial in some capacities. Now there are some capacities where you obviously want to maintain a good relationship with them. Uh, one of the things that we always tell our portfolio companies as they kind of go through uh, you know potential term sheet negotiations with strategics is don't sell the company without selling the company. And so a lot of times it is in the strategic's best interest to get as much as they can out of the deal, which is sometimes, uh, you know, limiting the effectiveness of a future competitor. Um, so it's very important that you kind of keep that in mind and understand uh, the options that, you know, you have and what you maintain uh, as far as autonomy goes. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it is something that, you know, you should treat on a case by case basis. And there are definitely positives, but then you should also be kind of cognizant of, you know, what the strings attached are, as my head said. Um, well, great. Thank you both. Um, so following on from that a little bit, um, so I'm interested from uh, any of the panelists' perspective, you know, um, as you're looking at potential funders, right? And Matt, you said your number one job is to make sure you, you know, you don't run out of money, you've got money and, you know, on some level, Anyone that will give you money is great. You know, however, you know the the, the context is is um, th that's not true. 
but looking at um, corporates versus generalist VCs versus Shashank, you said you're a generalist clean tech, you know, or climate tech. Yeah, you know, of right. Yeah. You know, versus someone that's more specialized. Um, you know, Matt, as you've gone through the process before in fundraising, um, have you reality versus ideal, right? Like if you, <laughs> in terms of finding that investor or those investors looking at generalists versus um, specialists looking at regional focused versus national looking at, right? At, at the end of the day, does it really matter? Or is it just whoever? You know, I mean, the re the real answer yeah. is when you're worried about making payroll, it, it matters because like Shashank said, you never want to sell yourself short, right? The last thing I'm going to do is get to add someone to the cap table or in the boardroom who is going to make our life miserable in the future, right? And so we want to make sure that we are doing our due diligence enough to know that we are not, you know, solving our pain today only to have a lot more pain a month, two months, a year from now. So it I don't want to be flippant and say it doesn't matter. It 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 does. Um, given what our technology is, right? It's not, we're not building electric vehicles, right? We are not doing the next generation of you know lithium air battery technologies. Motors are very specific. It takes takes a special person, takes a special venture capitalist to say, I can get excited about motors, right? I'm going to go to a party and tell my friends that the last thing I invested in was a motor company that spun out of UW Madison. You know, it takes the Venn diagram of people and it shrinks it down pretty far. So I we are already talking. <laughs> we're already talking to people that get it, that understand the big picture, and that is great. The other thing that is super important to me, more so now than ever before, is is someone that understands technology development is not linear. It is going to take us time, and if we shortcut things now, we will pay for it later. And I have lived the downside of this as well. So we are looking for more patient money. I don't want to be invested. I, I say this, but I don't want to eat my words later. But if someone is at the, you know, at the end of their fund and their LPs are looking for payback in the next three to four years, it is not likely not a good fit for us. We are not good, we do not fit that mold. Now it, that is the reality. So it's it's about the the patience of the money, it's about their understanding of the market. And it's really, truly their understanding that, that tech development is really freaking hard. And it just, and you just can't predict how it's going to go. Uh, sorry, looks like you've got a follow-up comment there. Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, that's definitely true. Um, I, I do think, you know, there's also value in having diversity amongst the investors in your, on your cap table. Cause you know, Truth be told, a lot of them will bring, you know, different things to the table. Almost all of them will like over promise and under deliver, just given the nature of things. Um, but, you know, having uh, investors with different focuses, whether it's geographic areas and connections to investors in those areas, uh, you know, connections to um, strategic, not for investment purposes, but potential business development opportunities like, you know, future customers. That's always a huge value that different investors can bring. And so the, the more you kind of broaden that pool you know, it is good to have investors that are absolutely well aligned with your company and what you're going to do. Um, but I think there's also value in making sure that, you know, you're not covering the same parts of the event diagram over and over again, with the same type of investor. Um, and generally, that's one good thing about venture capitalists is we generally tend to see, you know, value in being additive to the investment process. Whereas you go later in the in the capital stage, and you get to like private equity, most of those things are kind of run by a single firm, right? It's not really the same type of collaborative type of transaction that, you see more more likely in venture capital. Um, so Shashank, you mentioned that you have a longer timeline than um, other funds potentially because you're a nonprofit, right? And um, uh, sort of your timelines um, is one of the areas I wanted to ask about uh, coming in. So it was great to hear that. Um, does that create any conflicts as you're um, potentially uh, co-investing with other funds that may not be as patient as you, or as you're looking at, right, if you've got a corporate that's coming in as an investor as well, or if you have others that that have, right, uh, different views on, on timeline and returns, uh, et cetera, how do you manage that? Yeah, uh, there's absolutely going to be, you know, differences in terms of what the expectations are from for a given investment and the route a company should take at any given time. Um, you know, I think just taking a step back, um, you know, we 
obviously being, uh, you know, what we call patient capital, you know, we have a long uh, investment horizon. Um, you know, I would say the first companies we invested in 2014, you know, like they're all still in our portfolio and most of them are kicking butt and raising lots of money and, you know, have hired lots of people and that's great to see. But not a single one of them have ever hit the timelines that they had pitches on way back in 2014. I know because I looked at the pitch decks way back in the day. And, you know, I would say maybe the uh, the the most successful one was about 100 percent behind schedule. Right. So if they said something would take two years. It really took them four years. Um, so, but, you know, I we kind of think that b- because of the lines of work that those and industries that those companies are in, it really fits our mold pretty well, because there's not a whole lot of investors that kind of are willing to take on the risk that early on where you're going to be years away from like initial pilot and then years away from that to get to commercialization. Um, because like Matt had alluded to, um, you know, that's just not compatible with the more uh, typical VC model. Uh, and so, you know, I think at Evergreen, one of the things that kind of works well for us is, you know, I would say over half of the um, investments that we've made, we've actually been the first dilutive capital into uh, a company. And so, you know, we've been able to be there very early on, really introduce um, a lot of our founders to the whole capital raise process um, and kind of like help nurture that relationship and kind of help them grow along the way. And so, you know, we definitely make good introductions to companies or, or to, to other investors who may be a good fit for uh, the companies when they're coming to raise money, whether it's, you know, the, the line of work they're in, the stage they're at, or, or what they're kind of looking for in an investor. Um, and so, you know, there are going to be some, there there will naturally always be some friction. Um, and that can be from a variety of areas, right? Like as a seed stage investor, you generally get in on the ground floor. Um, you know, a lot of your seeds don't blossom into full sequoias. And that's totally fine. That is the expectation. Um, but then when you get later investors that come in, they obviously have a little bit more pull just because of, you know, at, at later stages, typically a, uh, a venture capital firm like Evergreen gives up its board seat or board observer. Um, naturally, we, you know, we don't really play super well in terms of, you know, getting a series B company to a series to a series C. We kind of play really well in getting a seed stage company to series A. Um, and so, you know, the skill set just doesn't really match as well. So, you know, it is a, a relationship that we have with other investors. Um, but generally, we tend to always work well with the founders. And, you know, even in our companies that have gone on to raise Series C and beyond, you know, they, they definitely value our feedback. Like, I'm always surprised at how, um, you know, how much of an access we have to, the, to companies where, you know, we may have collectively put in half a million dollars to a company that's raised, you know, 95 million or more dollars. Uh, and and that's not something I think you typically see. Um, but because we kind of have our more patient mindset and have helped the companies get to where they are and don't really have ulterior motives for, you know, getting out because that's what our investors require, uh, we, we tend to think that has a pretty good relationship. Um, and to, today, I don't think we've really seen, you know, so much friction where we've wanted to go one way and other investors have wanted to go another way. I think that's largely a product of, you know, the firm's been around for nine years. If you consider like minimum time to traction is going to be four or five years. Like, you know, we probably have a few more years before, yeah, some of our investors I know and our bigger companies at the end of this decade are definitely going to maybe have to make some moves and we'll have to see how that plays out. Excellent. Great. Thank you both. Um, so you often hear about, um, you know, so that there's questions of people or talent, questions of technology, questions of market, questions, right? So um, I'll start sort of again, just Shashank before moving on. As an investor, you know, which of those is most important to you or can you separate them, right? You sometimes hear tongue in cheek, it's all about the people, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But without, yeah, yeah. so I'll stop there and say. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like anything, it's going to be a a scale. Um, You can have an awesome person, but, you know, we've diligenced a number of opportunities where we love the team and we just hate that the founder is wasting their time on something that we don't think is actually going to amount to anything. Like, you know, that, that that's a possibility. At the same time, you can have an awesome, you know, platform technology that could potentially be game changing, but not really have the founder that is the right person to kind of take it on for, you know, a number of different reasons. So it's always going to be a, a scale. I think if we had to, you know, kind of prioritize what we really like feel like is the first and foremost, I think it does come down to the people running the company. Um, and, and, and largely that's because I think when you have a strong management team, I generally think you have more of an ability to maneuver the company into where it seems like it should go. Whereas if you have like a really awesome product, but not as strong as a management team, sometimes, you know, 
you can, and Matt will probably talk about this at, at length, but like, there's going to be a whole bunch of pivots you make as a company, um, whether you're in a mature market or whether you're selling into a market that's yet to exist. Um, and really having a strong founder who really understands the value proposition of what they are selling uh, and really understands the customer and the problem that they are solving, I think is the most valuable thing you can have in, in terms of a new enterprise. Um, you know, obviously you need to have a product that solves a problem, but sometimes, you know, the discovery of that is not always obvious and having a team that you have confidence in being able to do that, in my experience, kind of goes long, uh, you know, further than just having the technology. Um, so definitely, you know, you have to think about everything. I would, I would think the aptitude of the management team is probably first, especially, you know, when you invest at our stage, at seed stage, you know, a lot of what you are investing in is the, is the person, you know, there's no metrics you can look at for customer traction. You're not really realizing any recurring revenue. Um, so what you're really going on is, you know, obviously the person and the product, but yeah. So then, um, then person being like the people being so important and right. The, um, the experience and this ties in a little bit to the, to questions of, of place. And Jeffrey, thinking about how we can train up scientists and engineers to become, right, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, um, but counterbalancing that with the idea of, gosh, wouldn't it be great to have Matt come in as my CEO after he's successful, um, right, exiting C Motive, so he can be the CEO of my eighth company instead of me going and training up a brand new person who's never done anything except their PhD. Um, and again, there are, there are arguments from both sides around how do you train people up versus when do you need to pull in someone experienced? Um, so what's what's Activate trying to do to help with that? And then I, I'd love to hear others' um, uh, views on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think for an Activate's view, um, I think for us it's more about kind of like the stages of the company and where we're at. So I think if you're at if you're at like the idea stage of like a company and you have this idea, the person who's probably best situated to take that technology, start to talk to customers, start to talk, talk to the marketplace, start to talk about the benefits of this technology and the impact it can have on this space, it's probably, it, it should, in our opinion, be the person who has innovated that technology and can take in that feedback and pivot and work around and think about what those next steps are. So here at Activate, that's kind of our value proposition is that we wanna take these technically minded people who have game changing breakthroughs and innovations and give them the time to explore, like, can I be the CEO of this company and do that for a few years? Um, we have seen anecdotally, it is true though, that you know once these companies do get to certain stages, that it starts to make more sense for that person to maybe pivot to more of a chief technology officer or chief scientific officer if they find that their passions and skill sets are more in that sort of team. You know, they want to re lead the research team, they want to lead the um, development team rather than, you know, the role of a CEO is obviously very different when you're a team of five versus a team of 100. Um, and so uh, we've seen those pivots happen for some of our alumni companies. But I think in general for, right, idea to precede to even see series A stage, I think it's um, really valuable for the technical expert to be the person who's out in front selling the, the technology. Um, and then uh, as far as location, so Matt, you alluded to, right, Madison a couple times, both in terms of weather as well as, you know, difficulties or not um, raising money here and growing a company here. Um, compared to Pittsburgh or Seattle or New York or other places, you know, have you found it actually to be harder to raise yes. money here than it is yes. Yes. on the coasts? Yes. Um, and then yet with that, have you considered moving the company or is this like you're staying here? It's founded here, right? That So <clears throat> look, some of this could be my own head trash that I'm carrying from previous startups. So my, my first company was a spin out of Caterpillar in Peoria, Illinois. So like I'm born and raised in Illinois. It's really tough for me to be here being a Bears fan, but that is a totally do not want to get into that. Um, it is, it, 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 it is harder. The, look, this is Madison is a suburb in the middle of a dairy field, right? We are, we do not have the number of people. We have talent that comes out of the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and that brings with it a certain like that that's that's a 
that's a little click. And so it is tough to, you want to draw people in from outside. I don't want to have everyone on my team come from UW Madison. Um, and, and so it is, it is more difficult to draw talent here because what you have to be thinking to yourself is, okay, and the chance that C-Motive doesn't make it, what am I going to do next? Am I going to uproot my family and move them from, I mean, I'm the case study here, right? We picked up, we moved from Pittsburgh to here. And that is a legitimate question. So like we do everything right at C-Motive, the timing is wrong, country goes in a recession. Where, where am I going to go now? Am I going to find my next clean tech startup in Madison? Unlikely. Um, and so it does, it presents real challenges for drawing people in. On the fundraising front, the challenge is that people are not in my backyard, right? I can't set up a meeting and go meet someone face to face. And I know we're all getting used to Zoom and everything else, but you cannot replace the face to face sort of conversation and interaction and going to dinner and doing everything else you would do. You can't replace, you know, someone being able to fly into a metro airport and come to your facility the same day and bounce out and see what you're trying to do for real. So there are practical uh, things that do make it a little bit, that put us at a disadvantage versus if you were in Boston or we were in Chicago or in Denver or in Seattle or the Bay Area or Austin. So um, it's not an excuse. It is just a reality of the geography we're in. To answer your second question, we're not we're not going anywhere. We are established here. We've got the team here. We've got facilities here. It financially would make no sense for us to pick up and disrupt what we're doing and try to relocate somewhere else. Um, so we we do the best we can. I, I think I'm just gonna add some anecdotal comments from our portfolio with Anywhere is I think the we have had, had a few fellows where we've cu curated them, incubated them from their, their kind of um, universities, but they've had they've decided to move their companies to like the Bay Area or to a a more urgent ecosystem and and the biggest inflection point is is around hiring and i think that's the biggest challenge is that it's hard enough to convince someone to move to, you know to work at a startup rather than what they're currently doing and then i think when you move to and when you're building in an ecosystem where there are other startups everyone you know you you trip over startups you know at, at um any restaurant or brewery or anything where you're hanging out um, it's a lot easier to track that talent and just that concentration is really hard, especially when you get to a point when you're scaling. Um, I think the primary um, uh, counterbalance to that for our some of our companies has actually been the investment community. So like local angel investors, kind of those sorts of groups have popped up in different um, parts of the country. Um, states that are specifically trying to build up um, specific funds for companies to stay in their state um, uh, at, that are spin out to the university. Those are some of the things that have not like held these companies in, but I've created more of an ecosystem for our fellows who want to build a company in specific geographies to feel like they have the resources to do so. Um, but so yeah, investment hasn't actually been a problem for our portfolio companies, but hiring has made the place um, an issue in the geography of building, not in the typical entrepreneur. Hunt. So I hear from both of you, it's the, it's the people issue more than the money issue for at least in your perspective for the, yeah. for the job. Yeah, I, I, I realize also I'm speaking to, I, I saw the attendee list. I know how many people from Wisconsin are on the attendee list. So I want to be very clear. Like we've gotten a tremendous amount of support from the university, from war, from like, like we, we, we have benefited and we are here because of that local support. I don't want to get any, I want anyone to get it wrong that we are not, we are heavily supported but we can all be heavily supported by the local community and still be put at a disadvantage versus other geographies. So like, I don't want to want to be very clear about that as well. Yes, um, thank you. Um, and I saw someone here put in a uh, in the chat, you know, if you've got uh, questions as the audience, please do throw them in uh, to the Q and A here. I've got more questions, but I'll, we've got one question uh, so far. Um, Right around how do you sniff out overhyped technology and sort of how do companies die or eventually become uh, successful? Right, and again, I guess the general comment around hype in this um, sector. So, is there anyone on the panel that wants to take a stab at that? Yeah, I can. I can take a stab at it. Um, you know, I think there there's always going to be hype cycles and momentum trains that kind of follow different sectors um and so you want to be cognizant of you know a like a a popular 
venture capital saying is you have to be contrarian and correct. So like if everyone is putting their money into batteries, you should probably not put your money into batteries. You know, a lot of, you, you hear a lot of, uh, uh, you know, hype around waste to value and circular economy. And there's a lot of different plays there. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, as far as how you snuff out when something is just hype and no substance, you know, I think it comes down to a few things. Like, I think fundamentally, it is super important to understand who the customer for any product is. Um, in some cases, that's very obvious. Sometimes the product's very fungible. Like if a if a company is making carbon credits, um, you know, there is a, a market. And while that's still like an immature market, generally it's understood like, who the buyers in that market will be, what they're kind of looking for. One carbon market or one carbon offset produced by one company is typically replaceable with another company. That's more of a mature product. Um, you know, one of our um, companies that we've invested in a long time ago uh, is called Numat. They work on metal organic frameworks, which is a, kind of like a fancy chemistry technique to produce um, slightly different compounds in order to, you know, tunable compounds for specific industrial purposes. Um, and so that is kind of a, a different um, kind of functionality that you're providing customers. And so there's always like an educational process there. So one of the, the ways you want to snuff out, you know, what is hype versus substance is understanding who the customer is and validating that they, the, the product is solving a problem. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is really understanding what is the differentiator that enables this thing to do what it says it will do. Um, you know, we we sometimes question, um, you know, tech, new technologies that have a limited amount of intellectual property behind them, um, it, just because th they probably at the end of the day will not be as defensible as they claim to be. And so, you know, if, if you don't have a, a deep moat around, um, chances are that someone else with deeper pockets can probably run and catch up pretty easily and kind of at the same time take advantage of advancements they have in other areas of their business like business development and sales channels um, to really kind of you know muscle their way in and take a majority of the market so um, understand the problem being solved by the but for the customer and understand the technical kind of um, you know innovation and why it is defensible is what I would say excellent great thank you um Another question sort of backing up a little bit uh, for Jeffrey here, and I know you've got your um, Activate Anywhere uh, fellowship application coming up. Um, uh, do you like to see, how far along um, do you want to see a, a fellow um, or a potential fellow? You know, do does having participated in an i program or, right, sort of other entrepreneurial programs before coming in, how much evidence of commitment and and traction do you need to see? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's a very varied, obviously, and it just depends on, often depends on the person. Um, I think a lot of the sorts of activities, entrepreneurial activities, um, uh, doing i um, I think certainly shows um, the right kind of direction um, and kind of the, the desire to learn and grow, which is kind of the primary characteristics that we're looking for in the fellowship and I think will be obviously successful for um, entrepreneurship in general. Um, and so uh, we do look look for those things, but in general, we've, you know, taken people who have zero entrepreneurial experience and are just applying someone on a whim with an idea um, all the way to people who have, yeah, kind of gone through the uh, the, the ropes and, and, on, and, and might have um, a couple of government grants, some SBIRs, but are looking to take the next step. Um, um, with their technology. And so we we uh, typically take a pretty diverse look at our portfolio as well to make sure that we don't just have all of our companies are really early, just idea based, and then all of our, or far of our companies are further along or mature at that pre seed or seed stage. Um, just so that there's also a lot of cohort and peer to peer learning and sharing um, uh, within uh, the portfolio. Um, so I think in terms of talking to people who are preparing for the application, yeah, certainly, definitely, you know, start to do some research. We we try to provide as much opportunities uh, and for learning also in our application process as well, because there's a bit of a like a kind of step by step process. And so uh, we ask for things that many of our fellows um, and applicants have never done before, or like doing a kind of a basic techno economic analysis of their ideas and things like that. But we try to provide those templates and frameworks also as a learning exercise. Because again, I think just trying to put, put more education in, in, out into this ecosystem just to get more people trained um, in the language um, and understanding so that wherever they are, um, yeah, we just need more talent and ideas and shots on goal into this um, ecosystem um, and um, trying to curate as much of that as kind of our end, end goal. 
Great. Thank you so much. We have a question here from Mary. Um, in the biohealth sector, Madison might be seen as having some level of critical mass of talent. In what areas, professions would we need to develop critical mass of talent for clean tech, climate tech? Um, great question. And I think I'll add just sort of um, uh, the comment about the comments from Matt and uh, uh, others about the talent um, problem, right? Sort of the being able to hire people here and have them wonder, what am I going to do if this goes belly up, right? Um, is something that in the biohealth sector going back five or 10, 15 years in Madison, right? Um, it was really, you know, I've heard people that have tried to make those higher say it was hard to do, right? Because same kind of deal. But today within sort of the life sciences space in Madison, it's beginning to feel like people are more confident that they can move and they'll be able to get their next job because they're right, a growing number of opportunities. Um, so so um, with that, again, beyond just getting more numbers of startups here, right? Are there other, um, you know, things that we need to do and what is that, right? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you tip that balance? So, um, there, there, there are some practical aspects of if you're a startup company and you find a talent somewhere else in the country, right? You got to relocate them to the Madison area. So one, you got to convince them, right, to uproot their life, right? They got kids in school. You got to do the whole thing. But there's a cost. There's a cost of recruiting, right? It is expensive to recruit people. It is expensive to relocate people. It is uh, Madison does not have the most friendly uh, real estate market here. So like there, there are some things that's like, we've, we've, there's the university cranks out a ton of talent, right? There are so many smart people coming out of school. Um, we don't want to lose them. And then if there were, if there were ways that this is where I feel like state and local government, this is where, this is where they could really truly help companies, right? A couple thousand dollars to a company like Simoto that's looking to relocate someone would go so much further then telling me that I could put in a grant application for $3 million and I got to match one-to-one -one and I might hear about it two years from now. Like if we could get, if I could wave a magic wand and get state and local government to do something that could help with near-term five-figure dollar challenges, man, that would go, that would go such a long way. It would go so, it would go such a long way to helping me recruit from a broader area and know that I don't have to look at my cash out date and say, well, geez, I really like this person that lives in the West Coast. I can't put 15 grand into doing that. It's 15 grand for that or it's 15 grand to get the team the equipment they need. So again, just thinking about practical, near-term, small dollar solutions. I think there's plenty of ways to do it, but people got to start, we got to start thinking outside the box if we want to do this sort of stuff. And so Morgan, um, I'm assuming that many of the types of policies considerations you're thinking about are more on a national level, more right on clinic. So not on the level that Matt's proposing here where, you know, let's get some local state um, incentives in place to help. Um, I mean, it, it could be both. And there are definitely, you know, examples. One of the nice things about having 50 states in the U.S. is we can look at examples of different policies and see what has worked well and what hasn't worked well. Um, Colorado is a great example of a state that has really accelerated um, climate tech. And part of that is there's a confluence of national labs there, but there was also a lot of like deliberate state level investment that helped make that happen. Um, so I think that we're seeing more and more models of ways that we can think about you know, extending that and extending that more broadly throughout the, the US. Um, one question I'd be curious for Shashank's perspective as well, because you're sort of thinking about this maybe partially as your theory of change because you're focused here on the Midwest, but the extent to which it is helpful to, you know, clean tech, climate tech is a really big space. Does it make sense to specialize within that space here in the Midwest? You know, we have um, a lot of agriculture, for example, and that might be an area. I know we're a Wisconsin Energy Institute panel, but that might be an area that would be really fruitful and unique here specifically. So do you think about that at all in your investment portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, um, you know, given that 
the, you know, the country is a very diverse place. The challenges faced in one corner of the country are very different from the challenges faced in another part of the country. Um, and so kind of like what I said earlier in my introduction, I really feel like our portfolio kind of speaks to, you know, solving the challenges that kind of exist in, you know, the area we call the greater Midwest. Um, and I genuinely believe that the best solutions for those problems are from the people who have the most experience kind of working with those challenges. Um, you know, but that's not to say we can't add on top of that. Like there's generally always new innovations and technologies that can be invented, you know, in many different places. Um, so I don't think that, you know, I think that's a great starting point. Um, I think one of the cool things that we always like are amazed by is, you know, we have a number of events that we host throughout the year for where our founders and CEOs kind of come together for, you know, different events uh, and hearing, you know, the challenges of, you know, a regenerative farming uh, company based in Washington, Iowa has with a long duration energy storage based in Champaign, Illinois, like the conversations that they have, there's some commonality there, even though those two businesses cannot be further apart in terms of where they live in the industrial sectors. Um, so I do think that there's that type of collaboration is, I think, again, a little, um, you know, the Midwest is at a disadvantage for it just because of, you know, the Midwest is a large area. When we look at like where there's a lot of VC dollars, like the Bay Area is very concentrated in terms of, you know, how, you know, San Francisco is like a seven mile by seven mile peninsula. Um, and so, you know, when when you just have that large um, swath of land, it's just, you know, the idea generation um, and, and kind of like mingling of people working on maybe not slightly the same, but related challenges um, is inherently going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so, but I do think that there's uh, a huge place for, you know, state and local initiatives there to kind of help foster those um, type of gatherings and try to make it clear that, you know, even though, you know, people working at C-Motive are working on one startup, there are other startups doing very cool things that also, you know, may not be well known. Um, I think that there's a lot that can be done in small and large cities to just kind of just elevate um, kind of the general awareness of what, you know, companies are doing, what the initiatives are. Um, and that's, I, I think, something that doesn't really take a lot of resources. Thank you. Um... So we're, we're approaching uh, the end of our time here. Um, one general question um, for anyone on the panel going back. So I, we've alluded to, right, sort of clean tech 1.0 and the bust and the uh, difficulties raising money, right, within clean tech and climate tech. And I guess just a question for anyone is how different or more difficult is it than anyone else trying to raise money right now and um you know are the right the headwinds versus tailwinds at a macro level versus right just the climate tech specific ones right is it is it really any different um i guess is my question for everyone uh i can go first um i definitely have a lot of thoughts on this because i live it every day but there's definitely headwinds and, and tailwinds um i generally believe that the tailwinds are uh, stronger in duration and momentum than the headwinds are. Um, so as far as, you know, what the, let's start with the tailwinds. Like I think, you know, with every passing season and every passing year, I think the general understanding and knowledge of the immediacy of, you know, combating climate change and the effect of, you know, emissions um, is, is growing. And so I, I naturally think that like over time, it will be higher and higher up you know, individuals and government consciousness, corporate consciousness to kind of help do their part to help combat that general trend. So that's a huge tailwind for like a terrible reason, but it's a tailwind for our sector. Um, I think another big tailwind is just technology, technology development. You know, things tend to improve over time. A lot of the challenges that kind of faced, you know, clean tech 1.0, if we consider the price of like solar energy and the levelized cost of energy coming from photovoltaic panels, then to now, it's like two orders of magnitude difference. So like generally things progress on, uh, you know, a, things get cheaper over time, which I think, you know, as a free market makes decisions, like will generally help renewables and, you know, where investments are going now. Um, so I think that those are, are pretty big tailwinds that will continue. I think another tailwind that also speaks well to the Midwest is, you know, we've seen a lot of policy in the past year and a half uh, between the bipartisan infrastructure law, the CHIPS Act, and definitely the Inflation Reduction Act. And we've seen definitely in my lifetime, and I'm a little over 30 years old, um, the most, you know, foreign direct investment into uh, factories and, you know, different industrial uh, sectors 
all across the country. You know, it's not limited to one area. And so I think generally those are all things that are really strong momentum for the clean tech, you know, 2.0, if that's what we want to call it, uh, that exists today. As far as the headwinds go, like right now in the, in the short term, call it the next 12 to 18, maybe 30 months, like interest rates being very high and the Federal Reserve combating inflation is terrible for the venture capital industry. And, you know, that's largely because if you compare it to 2020 and 2021, when interest rates were like as low as they could be, any type of venture investment looked pretty attractive because there was some potential there for, you know, having some financial returns. Nowadays, when you have interest rates that are, you know, the highest they've been in about 20 years, you know, the bar that a venture capital fund needs to clear in order to raise money or that a startup like C-Motive needs to show in their future projections over time gets a lot higher because what they're being measured against is just, you know, actual tangible returns that didn't exist a couple of years ago. So, you know, that's a short term headwind, but it is very, you know, not to sugarcoat it, it, it makes you know, Matt's job very difficult right now, doing hardware and capital intensive investments um, is something that compared to two years ago, looks a lot less attractive now. But, you know, that being said, there's always going to be some balance between tailwinds and headwinds. I generally think that the tailwinds that the sector has will over time kind of erode at the headwinds. And hopefully those headwinds are really like a short term thing. Hopefully two years from now, we're looking at a much friendlier fundraising environment. But a lot of companies are going to have to face some difficult decisions in the next two years as they raise money. <laughs> I hope you're getting your checkbook ready, man. <laughs> so you're telling yeah. everyone, everyone in our audience, go like spend the next two years as Activate Fellows. You finish that, you raise your money and go launch your company. I would <laughs> take it the other way. If you have great conviction that what you are doing is very important and you will be successful at it, now is the right time to start. Because if you look at like the environment is unfriendlier, but there's a lot less you know fish in the sea as it were. Um, so generally, you know, you have to beat out less people is kind of a, a weird way of looking at it. But if you look at history, you know, the most successful companies that like that survived from the dot com burst, you know, really grew up in times of, you know, not a great economy, high interest rates. They really had to have discipline. And that's really like the factors that companies have to show now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Matt, did you have other comments there? Or? I'm, I'm just, I'm just hoping I can make it. I'm just hoping I can make it 30 months. Like the reality <laughs> is that no heart, like no investor is going to let me put enough money in the bank to have a 30 month runway. Like that's the reality. It's not going to happen. You can't do that. You're not going to dilute yourself in evaluation now to give yourself. So, like I agree with Shashank, 100 percent agree that in the long term the tailwinds are much, much stronger. Man, I lose sleep every freaking night worried about the next 12 to 30 months of uh, headwinds that I got in front of me. And so like we, we will succeed because I will die trying and we will make it through, but it means I'm going to get 150 no's before I get the yes, instead of having to get, you know, punched in the stomach 90 times before I get a yes. Like it can be done. Um, you just, again, this is as the startup on the panel here, like, and you just got to be willing to just get beat up over and over and over and over and over again to get to that yes. So I am now just talking myself out of what fun I've got in front of me for the next uh, <laughs> 12 years. Well, with that, I'll close. So I was at another, the Wisconsin Technology Council had um, their uh, monthly luncheon today and gave sort of an update on um, uh, state of uh, investing in Wisconsin so far year to date. And you know, like everywhere else in the country, right? Everything's down, both in terms of number of deals, number of you know do total dollars invested, et cetera. Um, one of the panelists at that um, noted that, right, sort of um, per the longer term tailwinds, right? There's 2.2 trillion dollars sitting on the sidelines that needs to be invested in, right, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, plus 300 billion dollars in new federal funding going into innovation related activities, right? So. Um, it's going to be hard for a little while for people to get access to that. Um, but again, longer term, um, and again, going back to to the huge um, problems facing us, right, slash opportunities to help solve the issues facing all of us um, as a society and a planet. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm excited that folks like um, 
the panelists as well as the attendees are working on that. Um, and with that, um, we've got a minute here. Any final thoughts or comments um, from uh, any of uh, our panelists? Um, and uh, again, thank you everyone for taking the time uh, today to join us. I mean, I'm, I'm, you can send those checks, Kara, Matt Maroon to see motive, right? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> point, trillion, man, just, uh, just add another zero to it. I, I would just say like, I completely uh, sympathize with Matt and I've like, you know, even for the year that I've been at Evergreen, like it's been a journey uh, following kind of this, you know, what c has been doing, but you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for the people on the webinar, like you will have a huge amount of impact on that thing you are working on. Um, and, you know, I think for the right product, when you find the right customer, like the amount of satisfaction that you will feel will be like tough to parallel in any other career choice you make. So I wouldn't be deterred by it. We just want you to be aware of the current situation. <laughs> Yeah, look, yeah, and it, it's good point. I don't want to be the, the the negative one, although I have been for the past hour and 15 minutes, but I think it's important for people to understand the reality, right? We we I participate in enough of these panels where we, you know, wax poetically about it. This is important stuff. This is important work. It takes smart people to do it, but just go into it with your eyes open that it's going to be tough. And like, you have to have the drive and the grind, and then know that you are going to get it in self-satisfaction of actually doing it. That's that's why I've done this. This is why I'm doing it for the seventh time. It's sure as hell is not because it's been super lucrative for me, but it's because I know that if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? So I, I, um, yeah. Oh, but it has the chance to be very lucrative. Oh, a hundred percent. These are, <laughs> these are each one's a lottery ticket. Absolutely. That's right. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, thank you um, again. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it was a, a great panel, and I'll let Scott wrap it up for us. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Abram, for moderating and uh, asking a lot of great questions of all of our panelists and really a lot of great insights, uh, both kind of for the startups, but then also for what we can do as a community, what we can do as a state to help uh, support the local ecosystem here. So thank you all again, and uh, hope to see many of you back for our next uh, Forward and Energy Forum. Uh, on October 24th. And again, uh, check out the rest of the Innovate Week. Uh, go to innovate.wist.edu to check out all the other events uh, happening this week. Have a good day, everyone.